now let's move on with uh, the first speaker of today, and that is uh, Professor Mina Teicher uh, from uh, Bar-Ilan. So let me introduce Mina to all of you. She's an uh, official guest uh, of uh, our uh, first uh, event. Mina is a fantastic scientist who started her career in uh, automorphic forms with Ilya Petetsky Shapiro and then in algebraic geometry with Boris Moishizon. She uh, combines in herself uh, the classical knowledge of the Russian school and also of American and Israeli schools. And today she works in many areas of uh, applied mathematics, from uh, math biology to complex sciences to neuron sciences, and some of this you will hear in her talk. But besides that, she has been a great champion for promoting women of mathematics and fantastic organizer of science. She has been a deputy minister of science for promoting science in uh, Israel. She was instrumental in creating the European Research Council uh, in this, exactly in uh, participating, uh, participation of Israel in it. And of course, she has played an important role in uh, uh, bilateral relation and bilateral science organizations between Israel and United States. So I personally have learned a lot from her, not only in algebraic geometry, in all great factorizations that I know come from her, but also uh, how to uh, relate to science and support all these uh, uh, wonderful uh, ideas that uh, she has uh, uh, introduced. So last but not the least, I just want to say that her participation in this event is because Mina is really half Bulgarian. By this I mean that her husband, who was born in Blagoevgrad in Jumoya actually, is a wonderful uh, architect, but that's not so important. What's important is that he speaks perfect Bulgarian and in fact, he can cook a very famous Bulgarian casserole. Uh, in Bulgarian, this is uh, Piles Azele, and that's, ex that's exactly how he presented, better than anyone else I have ever known, better even than my grandma. <laughs> so with this uh, short note, let me introduce and let me lay to you Mina Teicher, a great scientist, leader of science, organizer, and humanitarian, who is going to tell us about mathematics and analyzing great activity. Mina. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just share the screen. Thank you very much for this uh, very uh, lovely <laughs> introduction and uh, also a little bit uh, emotional. Uh, I'm sorry my husband is not here to listen to all these uh, compliments, but I am happy it's recorded. <laughs> so I can tell him about uh, what you said. I just want uh, one small remark. He was born in Sofia. His father was born oh, in Shumaya. Oh, okay. okay. And yeah. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't, it's not important, but oh, no, that's recorded. a terrible mistake. I hope you all forgive me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no, we, okay. And uh, so uh, mostly I'm grateful for being invited uh, to give the first talk in the inauguration uh, conference of uh, this uh, institute. And I, because of all that, and regardless, I'm very, um, I'm very happy that. Uh, you and all the colleagues and the head of the academy, they took the leadership in order to establish such an institute that could provide leadership in Southeast Asia and Europe and put people together. And I'm also, of course, very um, happy that uh, you took the promoting of women in mathematics as one of the first goals of, uh, of this, uh, this institute. Thank you very much, uh, and I wish success in all the initiatives to the co to the institute and to the women initiatives and other initiatives. Um, 
today I'm going to talk about uh, a, a application of mathematics in the study of the brain. Uh, the talk is mainly not to a brain scientist, it's to mathematicians. So I had to, in, to include um, a lot of background about uh, the brain in order to make sense and to give the problem some position within the general um, work or the general field of uh, computational neuroscience. Uh, neuroscience is, uh, and I hope the, the Zoom will allow the videos to be, to be shown. Uh, neuroscience uh, is a very interdisciplinary field and we will never be able to understand how does the brain work if we don't combine in the study of the brain as all the above, all the below disciplines. So it's not, uh, it's not only biology, even though the brain is part of the human brain, a human body. It's not only psychology, which is being uh, um, calculated in the brain. It's also, of course, medicine and electrical engineering and physics and computer science and mathematics and linguistic and even criminology, philosophy, and all this is to get, um, put together in order to understand how does the brain work. And it won't be able to do it without mathematics. So this is, a, of course, an issue because many brain scientists are not coming from mathematics. But mathematics is totally essential in order to understand how does the brain work. Um, I won't be able to talk about, of course, everything we are doing in the, in the lab. So I chose some topics. But first, I'll start with the introduction. So the introduction is about what we know about the brain. We means humans. That what is the collective knowledge about the brain, which is very little compared to what there is still to understand about the brain. Then I move to the goals of theoretical neuroscience and my personal targets. Okay, so what we know about the brain quite a lot is anatomy. We know how does the brain is built. We put different, we put, uh, we know different sections of the brain. We know that the brain has, each individual, each human has 10 to the 10 neurons in the brain. Each neuron is a cell, is one particular cell in the brain. Uh, we know that each neuron is, is made of an axon and dendrites. Axon and dendrites is like branches of the tree. We know that dendrites travel far. We know there is white stuff that gives food and we know some localization of function. What does it mean, localization of function? We know where a certain function is happening in the brain. We know the electrical activities the brain is made by synapse, where one neuron is talking to another neuron is by transferring some electrical activity. And we know that this electrical activity is being transmitted using biochemistry. So, so far we used almost all fields of science. So we know that um, the brain has certain sections. The names were given by humans, of course. It's not the, uh, part of the anatomy, but each piece is, is separated. Uh, we know even a more fine picture of the brain rather than the one, this one. This is a little bit uh, more um, fine. Uh, we know that the body surface of the brain is not a circle and it's quite curved and this is one of the challenges of neuroscience. Apparently, if it would have been round, we would be able to understand the brain much more than we are able to understand it now. And here, of course, you need a lot of geometry and a lot of singularity theory and a lot of fields are coming in to simplify the surface of the, of the brain. Uh, as I said, 10 to the 10 neurons. So this is a very, very complex forest that in order to understand it, you need many years to come. Uh, 
Each neuron, as I said, is made of an axon and a dendrite, and the dendrites are touching other dendrites of other cells. So this is just one, one particular uh, cell, and uh, this, these, dend these dendrites can travel very far. The motoric dendrites are very, very long in humans and also in giraffes, so one cell is very far. The white stuff used to, people used to think that this is only for giving food, feeding the neurons, but now latest um, is, uh, research shows that it has also some function. And the, the synapse where the neurons are, are talking to each other is, uh, is uh, made, it, the axon is in command, but the synapse itself of touching goes through one of the, one of the dendrites. And we know localization of functions. So the one that almost everybody knows is that the motoric command in the brain is diagonal in the terms of activity. So um, if we are um, raising our right hand, then we'll see firing. If we see some imaging device, we'll see firing in the left side. And if we're raising the left hand, we'll see firing in the right side. So this is one of the first localization uh, issues that was uh, discovered. But now in the research global, we are trying to find much more refined locations and much more refined functions, emotions, cognitive issues, and motoric issues. So this is explaining how the neurotransmitters are working. So the goals of neuroscience in general is to identify areas responsible for different function as, I, as the example I gave. It's brain mechanism by versus behavior, cognition, cognition and emotions. So the brain is calculating everything, things that we feel, things that we think, things that we do. And to understand what are the main rules of how does the brain work, we know a lot about how our blood system. We know a lot about behavior, we see, but we don't know what's happening in the brain during behavior. And this is the main goal of, uh, of uh, neuroscience. Of course, also medical applications. But we don't know what are the precise location of different emotional functions. Uh, we don't know emotional representation in the brain of many emotions language mechanism, numeration representation, mathematical skills, musical skills. I just, when I come to cognitive, I just listed now some examples of things that I'm interested in. And we don't know how does the, the network works as a whole. Which neuron speaks to which neurons? What are the rules? How to handle huge amount of... What happens when a neuron dies because you know, we drink a lot, we drink red wine, some neurons are dying, and we need to, to replace these neurons with another neuron. So uh, what are the rules of the backup system? And how many neurons are responsible for each act? So trying to understand how does the brain works, we localize the, pro the problem to neural network, a set of neurons with actions and rules. This is a neural network. So the whole brain, 10 to the 10, is a neural network. But we want a, a localized neural network in order to understand better what's going on there. So the virtual cortex, this is an example of a neural network, which is the virtual, virtual co uh, cortex, uh, responsible uh, for um, um, our uh, vision. This is a very uh, precise uh, picture. So when we localize the problem to neural network, we are very happy because it's a smaller problem, but we still don't know how does the brain work. So our main uh, goal, everybody's goal, is to understand how does the brain work, which is still, from, in my ideas, uh, the most, or let's say one of the most intriguing questions for the 21st uh, century. I hope by the end of the century we'll be much more knowledgeable. My personal targets are 
synchronization and compositionality. These are, this is the main conjecture of how does the brain works. Uh, biomedical projects, sleep disorder and epilepsy, and nowadays also uh, cancer, brain cancer. Numeration in the brain, some of the cognitive um, function. How to move neuro to finance, neuro, uh, neuro models to finance models, and ethics of brain machine interface. The brain machine interface, there's a lot of uh, challenges in that. Um, the mathematical method that we use are dynamical systems, stochastics, and wavelets. That this is main mathematical method that are being used in the brain, but we added to it because of my algebraic geometry background. So, and this is also a little bit our niche in, in this, because usually people from algebraic geometry are not moving. People are coming from stochastic, from dynamical, from applied math. So on the, we added singularities, geometrical data mining, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, probability. And uh, also moduli of algebraic surfaces, which is uh, work that I do for robotics. I, would, I cannot talk about everything, but each of them is a is very interesting challenge. Uh, first, before I start about the project, I start. I want to explain what does brain imaging because when you're working on something in the rest of the body, you can have a blood test and you know a lot from blood tests. Here we don't have a blood test of the brain. We cannot go into the brain too risky. So we need imaging devices from outside in order to see what's going on in the brain. So the imaging is a recording device plus a forgetful functor plus a cleaning mechanism. Because when we image the brain from outside, we get a lot of data. Not everything is relevant, so we have to forget some of the data. Some of the uh, data that we have is just dirt, clean, not, it's not clean. It could be the, a noise that was uh, during the experiment. So this is uh, th this what imaging means. And the imaging techniques that exist are intercellular recording, EEG and MEG, I will talk about it everywhere, PET scan and fMRI. The reason I put fMRI a little bit below because it's not totally imaging. It's invasive in some sense. You are uh, inducing the brain with a, with a magnetic field and you want to see how does the brain react. While the upper ones, the intercellular recording, EEG and MEG, are not, you don't use anything. Of course, intercellular recording, you are doing some uh, piece in the brain, but they, you just listen to the brain. You are not inducting anything on it. So the EEG, you all know, maybe some of you were, took uh, part in an uh, experiment for clinical or, so, or research reasons. And uh, you, the, bet, the more electrodes you connect to the brain, the better results you are going to get because you get more information. Uh, the MEG is, a, the, is a, the newest device. There are only 40 of these, maybe now there are 50 in the world. Um, it detects the magnetic field induced by the electrical activity of the brain, but it's not it's not invasive, it's just recording it. And this is a smaller one for, uh, a smaller one for uh, children. The advantage of the MEG over the EEG is there is no touch. EEG, you have to connect this, uh, machine, this, uh, all these uh, channels. You have many more. In the EEG, if you have 64 channels, it's a lot. Here you can have 248 channel, channels. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to connect. It's not distributed to the scalp. It's not disturbed by the scalp. EEG is very much disturbed by the scalp itself. And one can use him herself as a subject. Coming from being a mathematician, that I, I don't need any experiment. It's just uh, uh, my, my brain, my pencil, <laughs> and my students. Here, when you start to do work in experimental science, you depend on the experimentalist. So I learned very quickly that to get data, you have to convince some experimentalists that they will do the experiment. And it's, you are not uh, independent in your research. But with the MEG, one can use him or herself as a subject. 
and the student can uh, uh, use him or self as subjects. So these are two students that are uh, um, checking each them, uh, checking each other, uh, Ahmed and Yael. The disinvention of the Meg is there is no touch, so there's sometimes there's a little bit uh, maybe disturbance, but that one can't use monkeys. They need, you need to be stable, not to move. It doesn't detect radial current and there is low signal to noise. So you have to work a lot in order to get information from it. And it's called three, cost three million euros. The, the one that I have in my university because of the price is the only one that exists in Israel. So this, of course, uh, a leverage, and now we're getting a new one that doesn't need helium in order to cool it down. Before you need helium in order to cool it down, and this uh, helium is costly. So, uh, and so now uh, it costs more to beginning, but less in running it. So this is the MEG that we have now, and I hope that uh, soon I will be able to, um, to show and use the new MEG that will be extremely uh, useful. This MEG, it's supposed to have, uh, when you are in the MEG and you are uh, participating in an experiment, you are in a big room isolated from the surrounding, you know, because of the sensibility of the machine. Even when you show someone a, a computer screen, it's not, you, they don't see the computer, they see a mirror of the screen of the computer that was transferred through a few mirrors into the room in order to make sure that it's uh, very, yes, very clean. And, um, and it can also sim uh, simultaneously record EEG recording in order to compare eye tracking movement. But anyhow, we'll have a new one soon. Uh, what imaging devices of all of those that I mentioned I use? I use for synchronization, I use intercellular recording on primats. I don't, I, I still have the data to work, but we don't do new recording. It's very problematic to do recording on primats. Actually, there was um, a law by the Israeli parliament that the farm that raised these primats had to be closed. And this farm supplies primates to the rest of the world. So there is a crisis about getting primates for experiments in Israel and other places. Um, so this is synchronization. It means how does the brain work? But we are interested in specific cognitive skills like musical skills, numeration, mathematical skills, and more. And in biomedicine for epilepsy, we use mainly also the MEG, but we use EEG and EEG under the scalp because they say the scalp is disturbing. For sleep disorder, we use EEG plus many other channels that relate to sleep, not necessarily the brain. And for ADHD in rats, we did intercellular recording. For brain tumor, we do MRI. Uh, so when I say we, we, it's not I, it's not myself, it's it's not I and the students, it's the students and I. And the first uh, slide I put a female student, it's not all the female students, but the female students currently, currently uh, involved in different uh, issues, uh, including uh, mathematical skills, music, uh, brain tumor, sleep, uh, etc. Uh, these are the current students, including the boys, the men. And uh, these are past students that were involved in some of the projects that I'll tell you about now. And uh, I, um, I want to stress that uh, computational neuroscience is it's a, a applied math and, and computation. And it, the people that come out of it are very in demand in big high tech companies, etc. So this is a good a good alternative also for women in order to, because they have a choice later. If they want to stay in academia, they want to go to uh, industrial R&D, high tech, etc. And these are some uh, group photos, um, including one which is very recent, as you can, uh, as you can see from the, from the masks. Okay, so I'm now coming to my, uh, to my targets, which I, uh, 
uh, went quickly uh, before. And uh, I'm the first one, the one I'm going to, to talk in more in detail is synchronization and compositionality. Um, and uh, my work, our work was the first proof of synchronization in behaving animals. So um, it was the first proof and it was uh, extremely uh, news because it contradicts what was believed to be the system, how does the brain work before? And so it was a big word, but of course so problematic because if it contradicts what was known before, it means a lot of works that other people did uh, is, not, um, is not relevant anymore. And so what are the conjectures on how does the brain work? So there is chaos. Some people would say chaos, anything. Firing rate, uh, which means firing rate is the integral of all the electrical activity that all the electrical signals that a certain neurons received in a certain time and that and which made him to fire back. So if he's getting enough electricity, which is in my mathematical language is integral, then he can fire back. So that was the firing rate. And plasticity is the dynamic how the uh, brain is working under different uh, issues. Synchronization is actually uh, cont contradicting, in some sense, the firing rate, which was uh, for long, so long stable. Because it says that it doesn't matter only what is the integral, you also want to understand the, the delta between the firing. So if there are four, fire, four firing coming into one cell within the same distance, time, time distance among them, or two are coming one after the other, other than a break, a longer break, and two others, it would be a different command to the neuron. And this is synchronization. Of course, it's very difficult, was very difficult experimentally to show, but um, this is what we did. And compositionality is means in mathematical sense what is the the atomic what is the atom of a certain activity. Let's say if you draw an eight, is there an eight shape in your brain, or there is a there are four semicircles. And to make an eight, you have to make four semicircles. What is the basic atom of uh, of brain activity? And sin fire chain is the total, total uh, uh, model, conjecture, uh, that includes synchronization, includes their, um, the, the groups that are uh, in charge of everything and how the groups are related. For example, if I say the word mother, I say mother. So first of all, I say ma, which there is a place in the brain for ma. I say there. And then together, mother comes to the woman that gave birth to me. So the mother, the, the sin fire of ma, sin fire of there, combined to the sin fire of mother, and together we have, and together we have um, the concept of the woman that gave birth to me. Uh, the work was done uh, with uh, Moshe Abeles, who's one of the great uh, neurophysiologists. In the, in the world, and I was lucky to work with him and uh, my student, Tomer uh, Schmiel, that took the work we did here, and now he created a search engine in Google. Um, the method that we developed are used later in successive biomedical and, 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 and uh, project and hopefully numeration project. So what is the goal of the synchronization? Is to find unknown uh, relationship between hand motion and brain activity, which are not induced from the population vector. So it means that we find relationship that are even though the even though the um, the firing rate is the same, we have different behavior. Uh, in, with the same firing rate, and, and, but uh, different, different synchronization. 
So to prove synchronization, it's easy to say to a mathematician than to know a scientist. We will focus on accurate spike patterns using uh, some computer in, uh, computerized map. So we were sampling monkey drawings. So the monkey was using manipulandum, which is like electrical pencil, sampled in 100 hertz. And um, even though it's not continuous curve, it looks like a continuous square because it was sampled very often. So this is one of the sample, one of the drawings that the monkey did. In the same time, we were recording brain activity using eight microelectrodes inst inserted under the scalp into the motor and premotor cortex of the monkey. This is uh, not painful apparently, but people don't want it because it seems risky. Uh, but uh, the monkeys are doing it and the first step is to record and then to identify which spike came from which neuron. So you have to identify the eight neurons and the, the result of the eight neurons. Then you do spike sorting for separate the electrical signals from the electrode to different neurons. And then the data will contain also spike noise that need to be cleaned. So identify the neurons next to every microelectrode, sort the results, and then clean it. So at the end, we get something like that. Let's say there are eight microelectrodes, so we get eight, uh, line, eight uh, rows. And we have a flow chart. On one hand, we have brain data. On the other hand, uh, around the side, we have hand data. And um, we try to identify in the brain, not we identify, we define in the brain and in the hand events that are related to the brain and the hand. What is an event is a change, something that change, either velocity or curvature or, or um, distance, some events that happened here and there. And then we do data mining on both sides in order to identify the events that happen a lot, not something that just happened once. It's not any significant to understanding the brain. So these have events that happen a lot are we call components. So we have brain components on one hand and hand components, and we try to do a confrontation between them to look for relationships. So we are also, in, let's say we find a relationship. We are interested in the strengths of a relationship. To each experiment day, we gave a score in a numerical value that gives an estimate measure to the precise correspondence the synchronization between activity and the brain. The synchronization, it means we use the deltas between the firing. So on one hand, we have activity, on one hand, we have day, and we have a strong a score of the synchronization, a score of the relationship. It is done in seven steps. So the first steps, uh, we, are trying, we are using all the computation that we can uh, all the tools that we have develop new tools in order to find components in the in the brain. So this is from one monkey one day. So you can see that this monkey he likes to to end the a drawing with a small circle and change change direction. So uh, for example, uh, here, here, and here. And uh, there are many drawings. He does many drawings during the day. He or she, many drawings during the day. And we get it. I have to tell you a joke that um, there are people that are researchers. Some researchers prefer to, um, some researcher, um, just a moment, there's something disturbing in the background. Erez, can you make yourself not shown, can you just stop your video? Okay, thank you. Um, they are, the monkeys, they are trained in order to do it. So they get some juice every time they do a drawing. And at the beginning, they are sitting there and they have to learn the idea how to get the juice. So some, so some people prefer the, First of all, on every lab, there should be only female and male, not to have any tension. But then some labs prefer the male, it's more stability along demand. But some researchers prefer the females because 
for the man, for the male, it takes one month. He sits there. He said, I don't want to do any drawings. I give up the juice, no drawing. But at the end, after one month, he realized he needs to work. That's his job. For the female, it takes three days in order to understand that she has to work. So you, you are more efficient in your research. Anyhow. Uh, so a neural component was defined to be a pair of neurons, not from the same electrode, and a specific interval time between a neuron and a neuron. Um, example of neuron components can be, let's say here we have a time, the timeline, and we see that uh, from electrode one, uh, we had uh, at T1, we had a spike from electron 2 at, uh, at 3, at neuron 3, we had a spike, and all we get all these uh, windows. Now we, we take um, a neural component to be uh, the neuron and the, the two neurons and the time interval. So, for example, here we have the eight electrodes, first neuron, first neuron, zero electrode, and 20. Uh, milliseconds distance. This was, this is a component. And you won't see something that, that the two electrodes in the same component, because this is very misleading when it's the same component. Uh, so we skip neuron pair from the same electrode. And then we do the confrontation. We check how many times a specific pair of neurons, say P, was firing around an appearance of a certain drawing component, say A, in a precise time distance of delta. So we don't want less than delta, but precise delta. So two neurons, a delta, and a, and a drawing component. So for example, if we take this drawing component and we take the pair 2, 0, and 3, 1, and delta 2 milliseconds, so they are confronted to see how many times they appear together. Of course, this is after we identify all the components. So we fixed P and we count the different deltas that maximize the number of firings of P. So we take a certain pair, we fix it, and then we take different deltas. So you see in this picture, delta is either zero, two, four, or 100. And we see with this specific delta between the two neurons firing, how many times you see the appearance of A. For example, the highest one here is number four. So if there are four milliseconds between certain neurons that are firing, and in that case, 39 times you would see the, this uh, component A that appeared. It appears also in different, but it appears in 39 times. So this is the highest. The highest is 39 times. And we use 1,000 simu data simulation on, on artificial data in order to see what is the probability that 39 will appear randomly. And we see it's 0 0.01, the probability. So we take the probability and we do like many times we do in mathematics, we attach to the probability the minus log two of the probability, which gives us a, a numerical value, which is called the surprise. This is the surprise of the correspondence. This is how surprising it was to find out this issue. The score of the experiment is based on different surprises result we had on the same day between the different synchronization. And the more drawing and neural component are, are synchronized, surprising, the score of the experiment is higher. So we'll take a score of the experiment to the one day and we decide whether the result score is unique. So we, how do we decide? Okay, we have a score of the experiment. How do we know if this experiment, maybe it's, it's not such a big deal. So what we did, we take spike data and hand data and we get a score some way. We decide whether the score is unique. So I remind you that the probability, the surprise is minus log of the probability, and the score of an experiment is the sum of 10 highest surprises with a very strange, very strange attitude to, to probability or statistic to add 
this to add surprises. And this is the idea of Tomer, the, the guy that, uh, the student that was there. And because he's very, was very young in mathematics, he could do something that is really very uh, uh, unusual. Because if he was more mature mathematician, he wouldn't go to something that doesn't make sense. But he did something, he tried something that makes sense, so it didn't make sense. So we have the score of the experiment. So each day has a score of the experiment. And now we are checking whether this score is, is, uh, is correct or not. So uh, this score is meaningful or not. So we have the original data and we did over nine seconds all the data that comes in. Uh, for example, here we, take, we have a score of the day. We take the neural data and we jitter it. What does it mean jitter it? We spoil it. We take a different data that is, we don't touch the drawing, that is very similar, but the, the firing are moved a little bit within the firing rate. So we have a different, a jittered data. It looks very similar, but it's moving in milliseconds, but not too much, within the firing rate. So the original data and the jittered data are having the same firing rate. This, uh, a uh, technique was uh, uh, done by uh, Binnenstock from Paris, uh, introduced by Binnenstock from Paris. So we, we do it 5,000 times. You remember the probability was determined after 1,000 uh, experiment. But here we do 5,000 times. We do jittered one and jitter 5,000 with the same hand data and we compute the score of this day. So, and we're estimating the distribution of the scores. We have 5,000 data. We can do some curve to see what are the scores of all the, of all the data that we did. And of course, it looks something like a, a normal curve. We have uh, in total 5,000 um, experiment. Each of them has some kind of uh, score. Uh, this is the this is the experiment. This is the height of the score. So it could be that few few experiments would have the same score. This is how it looks. And now the question: Where is where is the original data? The score of the original data. Of course, if the score of the original data is uh, in the high, there is nothing. If it's anything within up to here there is no news. If it comes to here, it's already news. It's already publishable. So we were worrying, we were really wondered when we did it, what would be the score of the original data. And it comes, 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 comes. Well, it stopped here. So this was a great achievement because it's not only publisher, it's actually a proof. This is a proof that there is synchronization on the brain. Because if you move a little bit in milliseconds, you don't get the same score of the day. Moreover, none of the 5,000 jitter data has reached the original score. So this was a great uh, event. Now we had to start convincing all the people that use firing rate for the entire career that firing rate is not good enough. This was the surprise wearing uh, the jittering uh, uh, windows and um, it was a great success. We proved the spikes hold information. This was the first time that something like that happened in um, behaving animals. In the same time that we did it, um, after we finished it actually, when it came to the time, it was not easy to, pub, uh, to convince the non-mathematician that this is a, a proof. There was an experiment that was published in Science of synchronization in a, in a, in a Petri plate. So a piece of the brain keep, why, keep firing after it's taken from the brain. And there they saw that certain neuron is firing always after two, min, two milliseconds, after a, five milliseconds after another neuron in a plate, not in a bathing element, but that was some kind of synchronization, not re relating to anything, some connection between uh, firing. Anyhow, this was the first time and things uh, after that uh, changed. 
Um, I told you that I'm also working on different uh, cognitive. I don't know how much time I have. Ludmil, how much time I have? Uh, maybe everybody's muted. Um, I work on... You, you, you have 15 minutes. 15, 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, um, numeration is a work, uh, is still work in progress, is one of the cognitive skills that we are trying to understand. Is there, the question is, is there a place in the brain which has the theoretical concept of number, of number three, let's say. So is there, is, when I see three apples or when I see the drawing of three, or if I hear three knocks, so of course they are firing in the brain in different places for three apples, for three knocks, for the number three, for three circles. But is there always also firing in one place, which is the, the, the place of number three? This is a great question, not easy to answer, but uh, that's what we do in science. We try to attack even challenging and different uh, uh, programs, which we cannot do in industry, if we work in industry. Uh, so we use the MEG and we show the subject three circles. They see the figure three, they hear three beeps, they feel three knocks on the hands. And we want to find if there is a firing in one place that contains all this. It seems simple, but first of all, uh, to adapt, uh, it's not easy. So far, we have 25 subjects. If you are in Israel and you want to come to be a subject, you are very welcome. Uh, there, I said here 20 subjects, but uh, we want more than that in order to be able to this is, a, this is an old slide, I'm sorry. I said we want 20 and we have four, but now the truth is we want 30 and we have uh, 22. Um, we plan to use different uh, existing software, the BIU method for cleaning. I'm going fast in order to be able to talk about other things. These are some of the, of the uh, errors. Tashafatisgore et ha-matslema and then um, we are using, um, uh, these are some of the results that we got, but uh, it's still a work, uh, a work in progress. Um, we also consult linguistic experts because we are interested if there is a common location for, the, for the, the concept of three and the concept of the third that uh, we know that when you learn languages, you have one of the things you have to learn, the difference between three and third in different languages. Is there, is there a different place in the brain? And what is the, about three in sign language? Because it's connected to motoric. So this is, uh, I have uh, collaborators from the linguistic experts. Okay, the next one that I uh, talk about work in progress is, um, ethics and brain of brain machine interface. When we do manipulation of the brain from outside, um, I don't do it, but these uh, electrodes that put in the brain, we are only recording, but you could also trick something, to trick some neuron to do something. So when you are entering in to manipulate the brain, there can be a lot of ethical um, questions about it. And these ethical questions are related also to robotics. They led to, much, to automatic driving. Uh, it relates also to medicine when you are trying. And the question is, what, are we, what can we do and what we can't do? That's one thing. The second is, who is to blame if something goes wrong? And what can we do in order to prevent misusage of this um, of these uh, technologies? Um, there are some interesting events that happened. If I'll have, I don't think I'll have time at the end. But if I have time, I'll talk talk about it. When it comes to medical projects, I'm telling you now about um, sleep disorder. Sleep, uh, as I said. I work in epilepsy, sleep disorder, and brain tumor. So sleep disorders are 
very critical phenomena. And people understand now that uh, health is very much dependent on, on sleep. And the length of sleep in a day relates to life expectancy for up to seven years. So if something can give you another seven years of good life, that's not so bad. And this is very accepted now in the community that sleep, even though it's very mysterious and we don't know about it much, is very important now to the, is very important to the, uh, to the, to the health, to the well-being and to the health of a person. Uh, the, the one of the problem in disorders, in sleep disorders, are arousals. Um, when you, when everybody is sleeping, he awakes in the middle of the night for a very short time, sometimes connected a little bit with lack of oxygen and goes back to sleep. You don't remember it, but if you have too many arousals during your night, your sleep is not so bad, it's not good. So you're going into a, a labor, laboratories, you sleep there, you, they check what you are doing, they check other channels, how is it related to the heart, to the muscles, to many other uh, issues. And we want to predict it without too many synchronized channels. The original um, funding for this project came from Fiat uh, because they wanted to put, uh, we, we suggested to them and they wanted that we put in the headrest of the, of the seat of the driver, a device that will detect that you are going to fall asleep slowly, shortly. Uh, in order to prevent an accident. And before your eyes started to close. And this project uh, stopped when Fiat bought an American company, Chrysler, I think. And when Americans don't like any devices in the car that if it malfunction, it, they can be sued later. So, uh, um, uh, so this uh, Fiat stops. Anyhow, we continue regardless. The experiment, we have simultaneous measure of many, uh, many channels. As you see, EEG, EOG, EKG, uh, EMG, pulse, saturation, airflow, thorax, GSR, snow position. By the way, the saturation now is very famous because people detect saturation because the corona is lowering the saturation and it's a, it's a, it's a marker that you have to get hospitalized. If your saturation you can buy some machine probably at home that's not very good, but if the saturation goes below a certain number, you have to be hospitalized uh, immediately. Anyhow, these are all the channels and they're all related and they're all different combination of them give you different stages of your sleep. What we wanted is to predict play sleeping behavior, as I said before, and predict arousals in channels that can be recorded easily that you don't have to record brain, EEG, brain activity. And then if we have the relationship between them, then it's, it makes the whole issue easy. Uh, the EEG recording is frequency, amplitude, and shape and structure. I do very fast now. These are the EEG frequency in different sleep, um, uh, sleep stages. These are, the, um, these are the different shapes that the EEG recordings look. And then combining of that, we have four uh, stages in our sleep. Stage one, stage two, stage three and four, and stage REM. REM is the rapid eye movement where the body is paralyzed, but then you are dreaming. When you are dreaming is REM. Some, you can see that someone is dreaming from the eye movement. There are some disorders, not that I re, um, work on it, that when a person wakes up from the, from the sleep, um, his body is still paralyzed. So the REM is not finishing all the, all the criteria in the same time. So it's very frightening, of course, but sometimes it takes another 10 seconds and it's, uh, it's okay. Well, there is a lot of mysteries in the brain. Why and how, we don't know, but we are doing different kind of uh, research about it. And we did pair confrontation. We used the geometric data mining that we developed for the other project in order to see, I don't explain now, but how to, to see the, the, um, the GSR versus the EEG. And uh, 
we see confrontation and we see different, uh, we use the, these random windows and uh, expected, and we have a bit minus log two probability, what we call the score there, we call it here a bit. And uh, we have example, we take data mining in four channels, collapsing to one channel. So we looked for events, what we called events before in different channels, the EEG, EMG, GSR, and EEG pattern. And uh, we did from that projecting to get a one data mining to get just one line and we compare it and we received and we received preliminary result of pools versus saturation. So for example, now when people want to know saturation for the corona, it's more difficult to get a good device that measures saturation, but pools is very easy to detect. So if we, sh we show the difference between pulse and saturation in a stable way, then this will help to people to detect their uh, saturation. And uh, this is a pulse versus a GS, a GSR. And in progress, there are many other um, detecting arousal and uh, identifying arousals from different things. Um, I'm not uh, going to talk about it, but this will be my last, um, my last uh, slide. Um, I think my last topic, probably I don't have that. Um, there is, in, neuro, in neuroscience, we use different models and algorithms. In finance, we do the same. What I think can be transferred from neuroscience to finance is a crisis. The 2008 crisis was a black swan, as they call, something that can hardly happen and it couldn't be detected. It couldn't be foreseen that it's going to happen. When there were the signs, it was already too late. So this is something unexpected that happens and everything becomes black. This is exactly like epileptic attack. So I'm trying to transfer the data, and the method that we use for detecting epileptic attack to detecting finance. When I talked about it in detail, people say, we don't care about you, just give us a phone call before the next call. But that's of course not, uh, uh, not, possible, not possible. So financial market and the brain, they have a common, a common uh, this is what I just explained, a common phenomena of unexplained collapse, epileptic attack and the 2008. And this is not only financial markets and the brain, also cities and transportation and health system, all these what we call complex systems. Systems that we don't know what, it's a collection of individual, the part are interdependent, it involves multi-scale hierarchies, and we don't know how the act of one individual is, is uh, uh, affecting the whole system. So um, to understand it, we need to understand indirect effects, interactions, how part gives rise to collective behavior, and all these issues that we work on the brain are relevant to the uh, financial market. And we worked on being in conceptual and analytic and in a computer. The conceptual analytic is, is only mathematics. The computer, of course, is the computational, um, computational uh, part. Um, we have cause and effect, multi-scale hierarchy, interaction, evolutions. And uh, I think I will not talk about epileptic, uh, epileptic um, localizing epileptic um, focus. When uh, you want to understand where is the epileptic focus, for these people that the medicine is not helpful, they need an operation to take the epileptic focus out. So we do different genetic and different four types of algorithms in order to detect it. And this, our uh, method was proven successful. And how do you know that it's successful? It's not a mathematical proof. It's if after the operation, the person that got the operation has much less attacks and much less severe each attack. That is, a, it's a clinical, test to our, but we have a, a lot of this kind of clinical test. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, again, thank you much for the invitation and Ludmil for the nice words in the beginning. Thank you very much.
questions. So, how much did you get back from Fiat for that? Uh, enough to start it. Enough. No, no, it wasn't a problem. We wanted to move to the next phase. But it was once you we succeed in the first stage, it could it was easier to get money from uh, local sources. Ah, I see. Other questions? The Zoom is not the best way, you know, that to connect to people. Yeah, that's unfortunately true. So next year we'll do it in person. Yeah, that's that's given. All right, let's thank Mina again. And so we will proceed uh, with the next talk by Sofia Ambrupuo in uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes. Thank you very much again.